Welcome, this is where nerds come to learn things. If it's your first time here, click on the subscribe button and on the bell icon to get notifications about new videos. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoy it. Right, well, let's see what's in this big box. I know what's in here, but also you don't. It's another project. Well, I said the package it will. Looks like they've done that. At least on the top. Is it packaged as well on the bottom too? We'll see. Not so much on the bottom, but there's a layer. I mean, it's okay, I suppose. It should be alright. Fairly well done. It's certainly not the worst I've had. Alright. Here's the back. Let's get this thing out of the way. Let's check to see if there's anything else in the bag, or in the box, rather. Sometimes there is stuff chugged in there. No, nothing else. Cool. Alright. It's got a mark in here, says bad. Something. B input, OK. A input. Something. False reading. Why is this not sitting? It's wobbling. See it? It's got the feet on it. Why is it wobbling? Ah, see that? It's got a big dent in it. Big dent in the case. I didn't notice that in the photos. But then maybe the photo wasn't, you know, if it's taken a lot of that kind of angle, you probably wouldn't see it anyway. So that's alright, I can just straighten it back out again. So that's not too bad, as long as it's not damaging any circuitry inside. So, what is it? It's a Marconi 2 GHz digital frequency meter. So, it's basically a frequency counter. Now, I purchased this because I want another little project. I don't actually need another frequency counter, I've already got a whole stack of them. So, well, I've got enough. I think I've got about four of them, something like that. So, I didn't actually need another one. Um, but I thought, yeah, what the hell, let's get another one. And um, it's supposed to have a fault, which I thought sounded like it probably isn't that hard to fix. Uh, so input A is supposed to do 200 megahertz to gigahertz, that's a in connector. And um, input B is supposed to do up to 200 megahertz, which is a BNC, which has got a little bit of damage on the edge. Like it's been hit on something. Bypass filter. Resolution options tells you how many digits and how quickly it uh, refreshes or how uh, what the gate time is. Adjust internal standard. It's blanked. This is set for 230, 240 volts already. I don't have to change it. So yeah, Marconi made in UK as Marconi stuff was back in the day. I'm not sure what still is actually. Even though I don't know, but Marconi even still around, they're doing anything. I don't know, I should actually look, shouldn't I? So a model number is 52435-303Z and this has got a type number as 900F 1 MHz standard, which is a little bit interesting um, This arrangement is also a little bit interesting So it should be ready to power up Shall we do it? It looks, looks like it's correctly set Yeah, let's power it up, let's have a look Okay, turn it on we have a display, get LED, maybe that only flickers when it's got a trigger, quite possible. So 1 gigahertz gives you that, so it's, I don't know what the actual resolutions are on this thing, megahertz resolution, we have to shove a frequency into it and see which, what's actually doing there. External standard is flickering, gate is flickering, does it think it's got an external standard plugged in, which is why it's uh, playing around. It's a nice display. Let's plug a source in. 
All right, so I've got the thing hooked up to my Marconi signal generator. They actually have very similar designs, so that's cream and this is brown, anyway. Um, so, input B. There we go, it's reading that frequency, 26.5. And it's not too far off, actually. Resolutions, there we go. Shift it along. That's one hertz resolution. As it says here, one hertz, 10 hertz, 100 hertz, one kilohertz. That seems to work fine. There is uh, sensitivity, I don't know about that yet. LFM, I don't know. 0.1 hertz resolution. Just let it count. It's also going to be a very long gate time. There you go. 26, so obviously the first digit's off. Overflow. So 6, 500 kilohertz, 100 hertz, 34 hertz. Obviously the counting's not perfect. Signal level's probably not the best for it. So yeah, that seems to be working. Now let's just go back to a uh, more sensible level. Here you go. Let's do that. And let's just check sensitivity level, shall we? And just try winding the sensitivity up and down. Let's just reduce it a little bit. That's halved it. That's doing 500 millivolts to 100 microvolts. No good. So let's do uh, 0.1 volt. 100 millivolts. Yep, 100 millivolts is there. Let's do 50 millivolts. It's right on the threshold there. It's probably documented what the actual level is supposed to be. That's 60 millivolts there, 26 megahertz. That's only just triggering, struggling, so that's probably borderline. Okay, so let's try um, shove this off a little back up again. And we'll shove it in the other input and see what happens. Oh, I need an adapter. I'll get one. Okay, so I've got it plugged into the other input now. Let's switch it over. Well, it's not happy about it, is it? This is 50 ohm. That's one mega ohm, 50 ohm. So maybe this is designed for a RF input. So maybe the sensitivity is not as good. I'm on my maximum level on my signal generator. So yeah, it looks like this input A is not doing so well. I might actually need a stronger input onto it to uh, test it. Obviously this one here is working okay. And that label on the front, let's say again. B input is okay, A input has false readings, I think is what it says. So, so it may well be that the issue with this is the um, pre-scaler, because it's probably a pre-scaled input down to this, most likely. I do have the manual for it here actually. So you go, I picked this up recently, it's in the previous mail bag. So in here actually you have all the diagrams and stuff which hopefully describe how the thing works. Um, circuit diagrams what I'm interested in. Let's have a look. Looking for anything obvious. Obviously the internal standard's working, so that's not a problem. Looking for the input connectors and how they're routed. I don't see anyone here, at least not obviously. That's channel B, and this is the one I know is working. So, there must be a type of input from channel A, I would have thought there would be anyway. Keep looking. Let's look at the next diagram. What's this one? Control board. It's not that one. Display board. It's not there. Maybe it wasn't that first one. I just missed it. Maybe. I must be missing something. Input A must be on here somewhere. So the channel selection over here.
gate time, internal clock, lamp drivers. I mean, that definitely shows the input socket there for B. Filters. A must tap into this somewhere. You would think so, anyway. So, standard. Power supply section. Well, um, where the hell is it? Uh, I'm not missing a diagram, am I? Or if I've missed the diagram. Let's look at this one again. So that's the power supply configuration for the main transformer. Yeah, I must be missing something. Input A must be somewhere. I'll have to come back to this. Okay, so I still won't be a fun on the diagrams, but here's a block diagram that shows the, the design. Which I'll get close so you can see it. Okay, so there's channel B input which is working, and there's channel A input here. And as expected, it does um, go through a prescaler basically. So it's got a power divider, whatever that is, sampling gates to go to another counter here, um, primary sampling gate, search drive, also these detecting labels, VCO, channel selection here, and it's got the main gate there. And it's also got this counter and divide by N here, which is um, depends on which input you're using. Um, it's got an extra dividing step so it uh, knows what to set the gate to if you're using the higher range. I also got this uh, counter selection for the standard reference. So the description here it says that it's that channel A input Sig signal input is fed to the transfer oscillator unit which converts the input frequency to a subharmonic Subharmonic. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is going to be a bit more interesting than I thought. Anyway, that'll be a big repair video. It's going to be anyway. And after much playing around, this channel here is working, but only up to about 170 megahertz. It's not actually doing full range, it should go up to 200. And this channel here doesn't appear to be working at all. It's just putting gibberish out, so there's some kind of static noise counting going on. But it's not actually measuring any frequencies, it doesn't matter if I'm doing 200 megahertz or 2 gigahertz. Anywhere in that range doesn't seem to work. So this channel seems to have a problem. And I'm um, going to pull it apart and find out what's going on. already moving. That's a strange way to come out. Wow, that's an interesting assembly design. It's not what I was expecting. I'll have to straighten this case, I'll tell you what I've got it apart because it's bent. I'm not seeing any kind of burns or any other rework on there that's looking perfect. This side of the board on the other hand, this has had some rework done on it. You can see some soldering around the place, a few, a few spots around here, a bit of flux residue. And this side of the board is also warm. Around there is a warm, which is interesting. I wonder why it's warm. So it looks like it's got like a riser card in between the two. So it looks like connectors on both sides of the boards and it's just plugged in together. And it's got 
various transistors across the back panel here, which are um, called a power regulation or something. And that is the module. It's a bit more than a pre scatter by the looks of it. Very interesting. Alright, so what's the best way of getting into this thing? It's pretty well boxed in there. This has been opened up. Let's do the same thing. Let's open the same place up. Seeing as this is where I think the fault actually lays. Lays, lies, we want to call it. Oh no. That's where I think the fault is. Most likely. Especially if someone's been inside it. These little washers. And I kind of like these little washers, little spring washers. They put them on a lot of their gear. To watch out for them. I also like using slotted screwdrivers, uh, slotted screws, which I'm not such a fan on. But I do. This is nearly 40 year old technology. This. It's at least 25 years old. This unit. Uh, 35 years old. Get it right. 35 years old. It's a longer screw, which is interesting. The middle ones are longer. Hopefully, we can find something. But yeah, the fact the service manual doesn't seem to show this in the diagram, which is very interesting. Doesn't seem to show it at all. So it's an interconnection, but that's about it. Okay. Hmm, some interesting staining in here. Interesting staining, and it's near tantalums. And here we have a burnt tantalum. Right there. So, yes, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a completely new tantalum cap. I've never seen one that bad. <laughs> Alright, get it close up so you can see it. Right there. See how bad that is? It's completely charcoal. Yeah, so that's what's wrong with that. Alright, so this board looks like it can come out okay. There's um, some long wires here which go to some through hole, well, some through mounts on the chassis there. So those, that allows the board to move. Over this end, it's got an SMA type screwing connector. So I'm going to unscrew that, remove the couple of screws. It's only, it's only three, board, three screws on that board, hold it in. So I should be able to move the board around and get it out, looks of it. There's another board underneath. Um, I can see another connector underneath there. So there's another board in there that there's like two obviously two separate boards in there. Hopefully the other one's okay. Hopefully it's just the top board which has failed. But a tantalum capacitor, they usually they're actually pretty reliable capacitors, but they this one here is also discoloured, there's another one. That one, that one there. Those two there are both discoloured as well. So there's a few tantalums on the way up, it looks like. Um I was saying the tantalums are actually really reliable capacitors unless the power supply feeding them is really noisy. They don't like big spikes or, or high ripple. I don't like that. So the fact I've got three capacitors on this one board here which have all failed, that's not a good sign. That means the main power supply is probably failing. Um, which is in there, which I've got to try and get out. <laughs> I'm going to have to try and unsandwich this unit and um, determine how to get it apart nicely, I think. I'd have to take this board here off just like it would just unscrew and slide back to because it plugs in here, pushing the lens to get to the bottom board and work on it. I think that's what I'm going to need to do. Obviously, that means I can't work on it apart, but I think in fact, I've got three bad tantalums in here. Just what I can see from this one board, um, 
means this power supply is likely to be problems. So I'm going to pull that apart as well and check those caps. Well, just replace them if I've got something suitable. So I think what I'll do... This one here's got a solder blob on it. Right there, there's a blob of solder sitting on it. Trying to get the camera, you can see the blob. Sitting on the side of the cap. So, yeah. I'm just hoping it's not doing any damage, but I think I'm going to have to pull the thing apart and just split the whole unit. I think I'll pull the whole unit apart first before I replace those tantalums. And we'll start at the beginning and work our way through, I think. Or should I replace the tantalums first to get those out of the way? No, I'll replace them first. Need to make up my mind, don't I? That way, it's not damaging the power supply when I'm trying it out. But it's not likely to be the only faults. It's likely to be more. It's like a cascade failure. This is a bit more involved than I was expecting it to be, but it's okay. Hopefully it's just power supply, which makes it a bit simpler. And as far as componentry on here, we've got a uh, 74SO4, T0084, and a CA3046, which are all fairly common parts. So, um, I've probably even got most of these, actually. What's that one there? So, T0081. So the main actual ICs on this board are pretty easy parts to get. If any of those are blown, it's not a problem. I need to get into here. I need a spanner. Okay, so I've got a spanner. Let's get this board out of here. It's not a lot of space, but it's okay. Should have enough movement to allow me to get the board out. I hope so anyway. It's kind of stuck right there. Of course, not quite enough movement. Okay. There we go. go gotcha right so this just fell apart it's completely disintegrated now top's completely fallen off so these other ones here what are they that's a 20 uf 16 volt Orientation of this cap is going to be tricky to determine because it's blown up. Oh, I suppose I can base it on the negative rail and assume it's the all negative rail. I have to take a guess. <laughs> right. Back of all looks okay at least. So that's the so it's 22. That's a 22. This one here is a 22. And that one there is a 22, so it's like all the caps, uh, caps are 22 UF. I have some, so that's okay. Uh, voltage 16 volts, even not. So, so as long as we've got 16 volt ones, we're all good. These are 35 volt, so even better. So it looks like we'll set there. So I'm actually wondering if I should change all of them rather than just the ones that are gone. There's another one over here as well, which is a 0.47. So I should probably replace that one as well while I'm at it. And we've got. It was at 1.47. Can't quite see. This is a 1.47. Strange. Um, anyway, we'll work through it. Then we'll get the other boards out and go from there. 
Right, take these caps out. I've already got one out. I've marked them on the PCB, which way around the pins are. So I can put them back in the crit polarity. Well, that's the plan. So I'm just going to go around and take out all the blue ones, because they're all the same value. Then I'll replace all those and I'll go around and do the yellow ones afterwards. And there's that big solar blob I was trying to point out before. Stuck on the side, which is really weird. So you guys can see that. Is that solar blob? A bit strange. And you can see how they did this colour as well. And it's common for tantalums, they'll change colour before they fail, or as they're failing, they'll change colour because they're getting warm. And um, that's a common issue with them. So it's a common sign. If you see a coloured a colour change on a tantalum, change a tantalum. Because the colour change means it's bad. Pretty simple, really. Here is a really ugly one. Okay, now you can see what's left of it. Which isn't much. That's probably the worst tantrum I've ever seen. Alright, put new ones in. Hopefully the right way around. So it's always good to have a stock of parts because you never quite know what you're gonna need. And um just having the ability to just drop one in. I've been having to wait for the parts to turn up, it's always nice. But then it's also the, you know the, the expense of having the stuff sitting around. You know, it's a bit of an investment having various parts in stock. But generally it's a case of not a problem anyway, you just use what you use. Being careful to make sure I get the polarities correct. I don't need a tantalum in backwards. I think they're just as exciting as an electrolytic in backwards, actually. Okay, let's get this soldered in. See if I can do this without any flux. We'll see how we go. It might be okay. Although I've probably got the wrong tip on here. This is what I've been using for MacBooks though. Let's see if it does the job. No, it's going fine. Yeah, that's working alright. Happy enough with that. The problem with this particular solder is the flux in here, um, it goes really hard once it cools down. You have to scrape it off the ball because solvents just don't work on it. It's the only problem with this particular solder. The solder itself works really well and the flux works really well. It's just really hard to clean it afterwards. I think that's all. 
I wasn't counting, I probably should have been. Doesn't wobble, doesn't wobble. Yeah, nothing wobbling, that's good. The only problem is the ones I just put in all yellow, and the ones I've got to take out also yellow. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's tedious. Let's get the other ones out, figure out what the hell they are. And if I've got anything suitable, I've got one UF and 2.2. Got loads of ones, loads of 2.2s, got some 0.33s. I thought I had some 0.47s, I guess I've used them all. I don't seem to have any there. Right. Let's get this one out and try and have a close look at it and see what it actually is. Oh, let it solder. My old friend. I like let it solder. The parts come out far easier. Oh, where's this thing? cannot make it out. It definitely says U47. It might be 0 U47, which would make sense. No, I don't have any 0.47s. Which is odd, because then I used to have them. So I've mixed them with the ones. Yeah, they're all ones. We'll get all those out. Let's see if we go. Was it, was it only two or three of them, wasn't it? There's three. Yeah, three of them. Absolutely sure what I'm saying. Can't even read it. Looks like it is. I'm sure it says 1U47. I'll have to get my microscope out. I need to be sure what I'm putting it back in. Let's just move this out of the way and set it up. Is that 11U47? Weird value. Unless that's a zero, I mean zero U47 makes more sense. I don't know. I'll go, I might have to measure them. What do you reckon? 11 U or 47 U? It looks like 11 to me. That's a weird value. Let's see what we get. Point 0.42. So point 0.47 is looking like you, isn't it? 0.42 again. Let's change frequency. 0.43 in that frequency. Hmm, my guess is 0.47 then. Just that marking looks like 11, doesn't it? It's just not a very good marking. Here you go, 0.45. So, alright, we'll go with that. If only I had some. Um, actually, because I've got some. These ones, these are 0.43s, uh, 0.33s, I think. It's 0.22. Hmm. I haven't got the right parts, that's really annoying. You know what I was saying before about having the right parts in stock is always handy. That's why I jinxed myself, didn't I? Right. Well, these ones. I think these are ones. Yeah. So what do you reckon? Put a bigger one in. Or is it going to be critical? 
Could be critical. Although they're still looking okay right now, maybe I should just leave them and put them back in. Yeah, I'm thinking one might be right. But sometimes if it's like a timing circuit, then the value is really important. Um, yeah, it may or may not matter. But fortunately, I don't have a diagram for that particular section. If I had the diagram for this particular section, I could probably work out whether it mattered or not. Um, okay. That's a negative supply. Because the positive was on that thick trace, which is the negative zero volt rail, so it must be a uh, drill rail supply. So it's probably just a power supply as well, then. Might not be critical. Negative rail to there, which is that resistor, which is going to this transistor here. That might be critical. This one here might be critical. The other ones down here, I think they're probably all right. So if you've got a ceramic cap across it as well, that means it's not likely to be uh, that critical after all. Because ceramic sign is actually wonderful. Yeah, PN four two five A is that transistor. Yeah, I think I'm probably safe to do that one UF across all of them. I think it's probably okay. So I'll do that. I'd rather replace them than uh, leave them. I don't trust them to be any good. Here's one UF as well. Alright. This is only the first bit, we've still got to pull the rest of it apart and check the rest of it out. This is going. So that may actually be fixed, there might be a nivet, but the fact that there's three of them gone means I'm worried about the power supplies. So we'll look at those. You start to pull the thing apart and check everything out because who knows what else is going to be going on. Might be other parts that have gone the way out. And I will give this a clean as well before we put it back together. Seems it's likely to matter. So, one. so at least we actually found something wrong. And the fact that uh, the power supply was likely shorting out means it could have been affecting other parts of the circuitry as well, which might be why the channel B was looking a bit weak. Could have been dragging it down. Okay. Tweezer. 
you know, people. Why is that way again? It's not very well aligned for some reason. It's wired away again. First part done, let's put this cover back on again. Let's get this other crap out of the way too, actually. Once right, so I've got that bottom cover back on again, now I can uh, take this circuit board out. Well, hopefully, anyway, find out. And we'll see what's under here. We'll take the other panel off the other side of that unit, that module, and make sure that it's okay. In case the other side's also blown up. I'm not screw over for this. That's better. There's a screw there with them as. I think it might do. It's got a connector between the two boards, of course it has. Right, here we go. Right. Well, the tantalums on this board look okay. No signs of discoloration. But then that's likely all to be a 5 volt rail. in the bottom. Well, those tents look okay in this bit. They look alright. Maybe. I think there's the part of the blue. The, e the uniform colour, so they're probably okay. Power supply section down here. A bit of dust in there, not too bad. Not easy to see into. There's a few tents in there, but they all look again uniform colour. Right, so they've got these big caps in here. Um, what have we got? 
1000 UF. Can't see the voltage rating. 25 volt. 1000 UF 25 volt. Axials. 1000 UF. So I've got yeah, 40 volts and stuff like that. So yeah, it's fine. I'll replace those then. So I can definitely replace those two. I can't quite see where that one here is. That is a radial which has been bodged onto the board. <laughs> Interesting setup. OCXO is right there. So right down there is a bodge onto the board. It looks like that's a factory bodge too. And it's stuck down with double sided tape. That's what it looks like. I know, now it's got a strap around it. So, okay, what is it? 16 volt, I can see that much. Can't see the value. Uh, we'll place those two first, at least then we'll try and get to this thing. Might have to take the back panel assembly off to move all this stuff out of the way. Oh, then it's got all these bloody transistors mounted on the back, so I don't want to do that. It's a pain. So maybe just that top assembly. I think I can do that. Let's try that. There we go. Just the, the uh, transformers coming loose now. That's what I want. So I can get the thing out of the way. Look at that. Love the way of leaving that plenty of wire on there so you can move things around. Awesome. So, visually, so a little bit dust, but not much. Looks fine. So just those three electrolytics in there. So those are 1000 UF 25 volt. That one there we have to figure out. It's got a little jumper pin on here and a header connector, which is interesting. That's actually on the diagram, I did see that before. I'm quite sure what the situation is with it. There's also some kind of reason for that. Maybe there's an optional board or something. So the positive are this end. Negative band is on that end. Positive is marked on the board as well. It's on the silk screen, which is good. And I'll have to try and figure out what this thing is. That strap around this is a piece of wire I can see it soldered through on each side and the other side of the board there. So that's all that is. Well we'll take both of those out, change those and then figure out what I'm gonna do about this thing. It looks like it's got wires going to posts sticking on the circuit board so I'm probably desolder from the top. And I'll desolder that wire, desolder those posts, I think it will come out. I think a screwdriver would be a little bit easier. Yes, I do. Pretty sure it's the right leg, I'm trying to disolder there. Hmm, might not be.
Pokémon. Bon. One. in it. Not a lot of room around the back of it, but that is stuck down with double solid tape. This, this is what this is uh, just here. Right. So there's at least eight electrolytics. Um, there's these two here, those three here we're working on taking out. There's another one just here, 22 UF, and on the Main board over here is 222 yes as well. So there's actually not that many electrolytics in that, which is quite nice. Um, and then we've got to try and get this top panel off and have a look under there and see what's going on inside that side of things with that circuitry and um, see if there's a problem in that side as well. I'm hoping there's not. I'm hoping it's just that one side was bad. If it's if it looks okay, I won't bother doing anything with it. I'll just leave it as it is. This side hasn't been opened up either, that screw's not been disturbed, so mm, who knows. So we'll get this capacitor here out, and then we'll look at that and forget what that is. And then we'll move on. Let's try and get this other thing out. So it's not a big gap to get into. Taking the rear panel off would be a lot easier. But um, yeah, <laughs> I'm being lazy. I think that's on a post. Yeah, that's on a post, all right. Getting to them is not easy. Really not easy. Come on, get in there. I'll sure, just cut it off and hope I don't need it. Now, can I cut the other side? I'm sure, I can get into it. So, uh, yeah, 4700, 16 volt. So, obviously, there's the biggest thing that could fit in that spot. So, I'll upgrade that. Not a problem. I'll be able to solder onto those tags a lot more easily as well once I get that other part in there because I've got plenty of room. Not only do I have the Danger Mouse mug, I've got some cake. Mm. So I'll do that big one first because that's going to be the hardest one to get into. And then I'll put those other ones in and I'll just work through this way. So we'll chuck a uh, big one in. Put it 
polarity is marked, which is nice. Unfortunately, it means that marketing is going to be upside down. I don't like that. Can I change that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take this post out. I'm pretty sure I'm disordering the right thing. If the hole's clear, yeah, it's going through. It's cool. want the 1000 UFs, which one should I use for this? 25 volt, which these are 40, wouldn't they? And 25 volts as well, okay, I'll use those. in I have to sort that little wire out as well, yeah, which holds that capacitor down. I'm going to have to change the length of it because it's uh, the wrong size now. Those are the two caps which are there. Positive that way. 
which are in parallel with each other. Which means I probably don't have to replace them both. I can probably just put one in of a larger value. So we put it in a 470 or something instead. These are going to be pain as well, also. It's also folded over. Come on, melt. Go. Now I'm going to have to melt those and fold them over. Alright, let's get these bloody 220s out. They're going to be a pain, I think. The old fashioned way. Make a blob and wiggle it out. Sometimes it's easier. Just like that. One. Makes it a bit far apart, makes it a bit hard. But it's working. Two. Alright. So any opinions about the whole replacing these with a uh, 470 UF instead of putting a 220s? Any opinions on that? Since they're in parallel anyway. Would there be a design reason for that? I'm not really thinking of Maybe it's something to do with ESR, but I don't know. I would have thought more modern caps would be better than these older ones anyway. 470 50 volt. I mean, even just the size is the same as those. Let's chuck one of those in. And leave it at Right, so there's that one more, um, just there. I think that's the only one. I don't know, is that a tantalum rather than electrolytic? I don't know. C61. Let's go and try and find it on the circuit diagrams. Sometimes the tantalums can be in a similar sort of package. So you're going to leave that alone. So that's that board there done. We'll put that top panel back in again. I think, oh no, get this cover off first. We're looking at this cover. All right. There's a trimmer right there on the back. Just internal standard, okay. That's what's marked on the back panel, so that makes sense. Get the screw, be good. 
Here we go. Need to push stuff on my desk now, it's getting a bit messy. Breaking original seal. Sacrilege. But I need to know what's going on inside this box. That all looks perfectly fine. No signs of any damage in there. That looks fine. So I'll put that back together. <coughs> 